Okay, so uh, it was never clear whether I was going to play music or talk. I don't know. I'm feeling like talking because uh, that was very interesting. And, and actually, I wanted to start out by saying how refreshing it is. I, I worked at Stein on and off for years. I think the first time I was here was 20 years ago. Um, so uh, quite a long time. But I, but I haven't been here for several years. It's been about five or six years, I think, since I was here the last time. And um, it's very exciting to me to see what's going on at Stein, uh, to see this research group here, uh, and to see what Taku is doing. Um, is such a breath of fresh air for me, such a breath of fresh air. And I want to, um, I'm just very encouraged. Um, because in my own practice, um, I reached a point where uh, there were certain questions that were nagging at me that were becoming more important, actually, than my day-to-day -day musical practice. And um, so in the last few years, I've pulled back from musical performance and uh, gone more into study and doing lots of reading and interviewing and thinking and writing. And um, <clears throat> I think that what's becoming more and more clear every day is that the kind of technology that is investigated at places like Stein is um, triggering a cultural upheaval of truly huge proportions. And uh, it means that there are questions on the table that have to be thought about and addressed. And I never saw these kinds of questions uh, addressed before at, at, at Simon. And then here's, there's these four brilliant uh, young researchers who are you know, right on the case. So, so that's wonderful. And I think that's great. And I'm going to start out by uh, responding to um, a couple of the comments. I, I wished I had a pen and paper while uh, they were making their presentation because they had all these ideas. And of course, since I'm older now, you know, the ideas come and go. Uh, uh, but some of them stayed. And so I have a, a couple here. I wanted to read a quote. I wrote this book. I, I've, I've been writing books lately, actually. I just, um, I just finished my fourth book. It's at the publisher. I'm sorry, even my fifth one. I have my third one here. And um, there's a quote from Edgar Varese um, that I thought of when we were talking about brains and monitoring brains. So uh, uh, in 1939, Edgar Varese, the composer who first articulated a grand vision of how machines would change the way humans made music, announced that sound producing machines promised nothing less than the, quote, liberation of music. And this is what he said. He said, if you are curious to know what such a machine could do that the orchestra with its man-powered instruments cannot do, I shall try briefly to tell you, whatever I write, whatever my message, it will reach the listener unadulterated by interpretation. Okay? Which is very similar to this idea that if we could just like stick a sensor in our brain, we could get the real message unadulterated by interpretation. Um, so 1939, same idea. Uh, at the very, very dawn of uh, the use of uh, automated machines to make music. Um, and in my book, I answer that by saying, uh, from late modernists like Stockhausen down through rock experimentalists like Frank Zappa, and now to the thousands of DJs who pump electronic sound through dance clubs, the idea that electronic music would give composers more control while freeing them from relying on human relationships to realize their musical ideas has been the dominant thrust in electronic music. The notion of the machine as a perfect interpreter of musical ideas, in contrast to the necessarily flawed interpreter that is human, has gone unchallenged. My work has gone in a substantially different direction. My experience of using electronic technology to make music was never one of machines as ideal musicians over whom I exercised perfect and exquisite control. 
But I didn't really see that as a problem, as the unpredictable and unruly behavior of the machines I worked with quickly became my muse. However, as the years have gone by, the meaning that I attach to this unstable and tense relationship between human and machine has evolved substantially. Um, I also kept thinking during the uh, uh, previous discussion of Douglas Engelbart. Uh, it, who knows who Douglas Engelbart was? Not so many people. Okay, so, so Douglas Engelbart invented the personal computer. He was an uh, 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 engineer. He was working in Silicon Valley in 1960. He was at Stanford University. And um, yeah, he's kind of quite an amazing guy. He invented the mouse and the window, uh, the, the all kinds of the aspects of the interface between how we use computers actually all came from Douglas Engelbart. And in fact, uh, Steve Jobs um, saw uh, a demo that Engelbart gave of all his ideas, and, and that's what basically started Apple Computer. So Engelbart's an interesting guy, and I just happened to have some quotes from Engelbart, and I thought I would read them. So he was doing this in 1960, right? So what was going on? Well, what was going on in 1960? Well, one thing, people were taking lots of LSD. Um, uh, so, Engelbart writes, I was doing odd job electrical engineering for the forerunner of NASA. For several months, I had been devoting most of my spare time to searching for professional goals. For some reason, I wanted to invest the rest of my heretofore aimless career toward making the most difference in improving the lot of the human race. And he went and heard a lecture by Buckminster Fuller. And uh, so th this was the area around San Francisco in the 1960s. Um, anyway, so he says, suddenly, uh, so, so he goes to hear Buckminster Fuller. He's walking home from the lecture, and he says, suddenly, up through all this delightful, youthful abstraction, Bob, the following clear realization. The complexity of the human situation was steadily increasing. Along with the increasing complexity had come a general increase in the urgency associated with our more critical problems. Uh, and then he writes, flash one. See, this is very 1960s writing. Flash, I had a flash. Flash. <clears throat> the difficulty of mankind's problems were increasing at a greater rate than our ability to cope. Parentheses, we are in trouble. Flash two. Boosting mankind's ability to deal with complex, urgent problems would be an attractive candidate as an arena in which a young person might try to make the most difference. Again, this was the 60s, so computer engineers were sitting around about thinking about how to make the world a better place. I know it's hard to imagine, <laughs> but that was the 1960s. It was a different time. Um, flash three, aha! Graphic vision surges forth of me sitting at a large CRT console, working in ways that are rapidly evolving in front of my eyes. The imagery carried on to extensions of symbology and methodology that we humans could employ to do our heavy thinking. There were also images of other people at consoles attached to the same computer complex, simultaneously working in a collaboration mode that would be much closer and more effective than we had ever been able to accomplish. Within weeks, I had committed my career to augmenting the human intellect. And he founded a center, a research center at Stanford called the Center for the Augmentation of the Human Intellect. <laughs> and, and that was his life project. And to put it in situation, you need to understand that up until this time, uh, what artificial intelligence meant was building a great big computer that would eventually, you know, be bigger than a human brain. 
And uh, Engelbart came along and said, no, instead of developing machine technology to, to replace, instead of trying to develop machine intelligence or artificial intelligence that will replace human intelligence, let's develop the technology to use computers to augment human intelligence. This was his grand project. So I'm going to fix the problems of the world. The, our problems are getting complex, more and more complex, but our intelligence is staying the same. So there's this split. That's our problem in the world. How can we address the split? We can augment our intelligence. And he set out to build the tools to augment our intelligence, and he came up with the personal computer. At the time, nobody was thinking that computers were these things that everybody would have, right? Computers were these big, gigantic things, and you would go to the temple of the computer, and you would, you know, kneel down and type into this big thing. And so you could say that Engelbart is the most successful inventor and entrepreneur in, in, in the last hundred years. I mean, look what we have. Look, I have this amazing laptop here that um, uh, is powerful beyond Engelbart's imagination. So what, I think what we were just talking about in terms of building an instrument is basically a musical application of what Engelbart wanted to do, right? All these things that the, that the research group just said. How can we augment the intelligence of the performer? in a performance context. context. That's the question, right? Well, that's the question that Engelbart started with, 1960. That's 50 years ago now. So uh, the, the problem is, the answer to the question is a little bit tricky because on the one hand, uh, he's been unbelievably successful. I mean, with this computer, I can solve problems that I cannot solve on my own. I mean, I can't, I'm not much of a mathematician. If you give me a pencil and a piece of paper with this computer, I can solve. Give me the right software, and you know I can do any math you want. No problem. Give me an internet connection. I'll have access to Wikipedia. I'll just be a fountain of uh, data. So uh, successful beyond his wildest dreams. But yet, when you look back at what he wanted to do, which was uh, reduce the distance between human intelligence, the capabilities of human intelligence, and the problems that our technology was creating, I would say uh, he hasn't. This, this technology has not augmented our intelligence even one tiny little bit. Uh, it, uh, so, so yes, this computer uh, makes it much easier for me to do math, but does it make it more likely that I'll get along with my next door neighbor? I mean, that's a measure of intelligence, right? No, it doesn't, doesn't uh, have any impact whatsoever. Uh, okay. Um, I also kept thinking of George Dyson. Has anybody here read George Dyson's book called uh, Darwin Among the Machines? Highly recommend it, highly recommend it to me, one of the most important books of the last 20 years. And uh, he argues that, uh, that our technology is becoming part of evolution. That's the basic thesis of the book. And that um, I mean, it's a very complex, art, very complex book, very original book, but it comes down to this idea. I, I, he has a famous quote at the beginning of the book where he starts out, he says, uh, there's three, I th I th I'm probably getting it wrong. But I think the quote goes like this. There are three actors in history right now. Um, no, three actors. I, I'll probably get it wrong. Something like this. There's three actors in history right now, nature, humans, and machines. Um, I consider myself on the side of nature, but I'm more and more convinced that nature is on the side of the machines. <laughs> Very interesting guy. Um, <clears throat> but he talks a lot about how um, computers have become very good at getting us 
to move our intelligence into computers. Um, which is a really interesting way of looking at the issue. And, uh, and he says, you know, uh, people are so excited because uh, we have this internet now and you know, humans can go online anytime and communicate with anybody else in the world. So, so uh, you know, at any time I want to, I can go online and for five minutes talk to somebody else. You know. But the machines have, conven- have gotten us to connect them 24-7. Like, <laughs> the machines are always talking to each other. We're just doing it intermittently. Um, and uh, uh, so a lot of what the research group was talking about, in a sense, was moving intelligence from the musician to the machine. Right? All the kinds of intelligence that they were talking about that have to do with performance, the kinds of intelligence that a, uh, a virtuoso trumpet player would have, you know, how can we build a tool that will somehow manifest that kind of intelligence? So it's interesting, interesting question when you step back. You know, um, why we're so compelled to do this. Uh, okay. no, next idea. Um, this idea of performance. So uh, uh, the research group is very interested in instruments that can be performed, on, instruments that can be played, which is fitting to Stein among all the electronic music research centers in the world is the one that's interested in performance. So there are other big cheese uh, computer music research institutions in the world. There's one in Stanford, there's one in Paris, there's here and there. Um, Stein is actually sort of by far the junior partner among this. The others are much more well-funded than, say, Stein's. But Stein's uh, interest is in live Live electronic music. Um, I think that's a problematic concept, actually, live electronic music. I think we could actually get into a difficult discussion about what actually live electronic music is. It's an interesting question, um, which is not to say which is not to say that I don't think Stein should be here. Either. A- absolutely, to the contrary, I think. The, the question of what's live electronic music is, in a way, the most interesting question. Certainly much more interesting than the questions that are being um, investigated at IRCOP, for example. Um, so, uh, why performance? Um, well, to take up a point that we were talking about, in the previous part. If you actually succeed in uh, making a technology that requires no talent, right? That's what Susan Sontag was talking about with those cameras. Now, cameras don't require any particular talent. Anyone can take a beautiful picture. And even as acute and astute an observer and critic as Susan Sontag, can go to a exhibition and say, well, you know, the iPhone photos are just as good. Um, so uh, there we've really lowered the bar. Uh, you can make images, you can record images, you can sample images to use the uh, to, to, to use the, the jargon of, of electronic music. You can sample images now, and it takes no particular skill. Anyone can do. Well, the first thing that happens is it changes the meaning of photography entirely. It changes the meaning of what a photographer is, for example, entirely. It's like uh, what happened to them. It's a, in a way, it's like what happened to scribes with the invention of the printing press. Right? It's all. It's, it's a little bit, I don't want to go too far down that road, though. Um, but, but the meaning changes. Okay, so I would also say that the meaning of live changes. 
And so when we have this discussion about what's live electronic music, we can't pretend that that word live is a fixed uh, thing that doesn't move. I think it's actually moving hugely right now. And in fact, that idea of what's, what do we mean by live is really right at the center of this huge cultural upheaval that's being caused by this technology. So uh, the research group is talking about mapping music. Well, just the fact that we have enough music to map is unbelievable. That is so novel. Um, so, improvised music. Uh, I play improvised music. Uh, there's a lot of improvised music at Stein. Um, when I was the age of the research group presenters, uh, I think I pretty much had on my bookshelf every record of improv improvised music that had ever been made. Every one. That was probably 50. That was it. That was all there was. So there was a discussion. If you were in the improvised music scene, you were part of a discussion. It, it was a real community, and you could, you could know everything that had been said in that discussion. And you could buy every new improvised record that was released. <laughs> you know, there were maybe five a year that, that were coming out. That was it. Um, when I was growing up in my little town, uh, if I wanted to buy some music, you know, I rode my bike to the record store. And if it wasn't in the record store, I didn't hear it. Yeah, that was that was it. And you know, my daughter now she has this iPod, and you know, she walks around with her iPod. And she says, you know, I I just can't, I can't I can't figure out what I really want to listen to now. And it's like you know, when I had 50 records on the shelf, I always knew exactly what I wanted to listen to. Now she's got you know these gigabytes and gigabytes of sounds, and she can't figure out what she wants to hear. This is in a way what DJs are. You know, there's such a mass of music that we need a, a professional specialist just to figure out what should we, we should listen to. Because th there's too much of it. We can't actually make the choice. Um, anyway, so uh, back to my main thought. Improvisation is also something that I think changes meaning. So just like when we talk about live, we shouldn't pretend that it's not a moving target. Uh, Improvisation is also a moving target. So I want to develop that thought for a little bit. So, so we often talk about improvisation like it's this constant, eternal idea. But in fact, it's always meant different things at different times. Uh, even today, if you were to go to, I don't know, if you were to go visit some pygmy, pygmy yodelers in the Congo and ask them, you know, what part of their music is composed and what part of their music is improvised, <laughs> they would like... There would be nothing they could say to that question. It wouldn't make sense. Um, old blues music. If you ask them, well, what part of that is written and what part of that is improvised? Who knew? Um, so, so where did our contemporary notion of, of improvisation come from? Well, uh, I would say that our notion of improvisation came from the 1960s, 1950s, 1960s, uh, at the intersection of two different uh, trends, uh, at, at the intersection of developments in African-American music and European music. And this intersection produced this notion called improvisation. But it was an intersection of two very, very different practices. So on the European side, there had been this you know, long development of the musical text, the score, which I, I like to think of it as a text because then it relates it to um, a much broader discussion of cultural practices. So. Um, 
the text had developed in European music from something that was a very vague roadmap to what you were supposed to actually do uh, to becoming more and more and more filled in until it had come to the point where it, it, it basically described everything that was supposed to happen. So that if I wrote a part for a trumpet player, I should know that it doesn't matter what trumpet player plays the part. I'll get what I want. It's a standardized, it was as standardized as a screw in a machine, right? The standardization of parts. Um, and uh, by the mid 20th century, European musicians, and I'm talking European musicians in Europe and European American musicians in the United States both, um, were starting to feel very trapped by this. And so their notion of improvisation, what, what improvisation meant to them, was an escape from the jail of the text. Uh, African American music, text had never acquired such an important uh, place in African American music. In fact, even the most complex jazz, bebop, which I would, to me, I would say bebop is probably, you know, the, the most, uh, one of the most complex musics ever developed. Rhythmically, harmonically, melodically, you know, extremely sophisticated stuff. Even then, the text to a bebop song uh, was hardly more descriptive of what the musicians actually did than the text of very, very early European music was of what musicians actually did. So that, you know, it's, it's a kind of a vague roadmap. It was almost like the kind of mapping they were talking about here, actually. Um, <clears throat> So improvisation in that tradition wasn't tied to breaking out of the jail of the text. They were never jailed in by text. What they had was an oral tradition that was passed down, that was largely not written down, and that was uh, passed down not through schools, but through you know, sort of master-apprentice relationships in much the same way that, say, you know, traditional Indian music is still passed down, even to this day. You apprentice yourself to a master musician, and you sit in front of them, and they do something, and you mimic it back. And that's how you, that's how you learn. Well, <clears throat> so they had this oral tradition. But one of the uh, primary characteristics of oral traditions is that they, all, they, they evolve very slowly. Uh, that's, that's traditional music. That's, you know, traditional music evolves very slowly. Well, s suddenly, the 20th century comes, and this folk tradition, this oral music tradition, somehow goes on this hyper escapade of innovation. W one of the most extraordinary outbursts of innovation ever in music, really where every seven years, the music reinvents itself completely. Uh, you know, from Jelly Roll Morton to Louis Armstrong to, you know, Parker to Coltrane to Cecil Taylor. Um, so what was it? You know, what bee got into that bonnet? You know, what, what was it that took this uh, folk tradition which never changes, or changes, you know, had changed so little over the previous time that you could still hear all this African in it. And then suddenly, boom! So <clears throat> I think it was recording. Uh, so already we have technology, we have machines, okay? So, <clears throat> so for example, without recording, if uh, the only time you could ever go hear Louis Armstrong play, was when he happened to come through your town and you could hear him that one time. And that was maybe it. Or maybe you got to hear him two times or three times. But that was it. Uh, jazz would not have been possible 
But what happened was there was this uh, oral tradition that was not boxed in by text. And once they had recording, then you could sit down and you could really take apart Louis Armstrong's play. And you could say, wow, there's this rhythmic thing he's doing here. He's swinging this thing. You couldn't have done that without recording. Okay? Because that, that kind of nuance was actually, uh, you would have killed it if you would have put it into a text. Okay? So this oral tradition was able to take advantage of the technology in a way that European music couldn't because European music was committed to the text. So what happened when recording came to European music was that performances became even more rigid. And actually, there's interesting historical research in the last few years that shows that uh, before recording, for example, or orchestras in Europe were much freer in their interpretation of scores. They would run the tempo all over the place. Uh, you know, the conductors were really, they would take the score as like sort of the way people in Naples take traffic lights, you know, sort of like a suggestion. <laughs> maybe you want to stop here, but you know, maybe not. Um, so uh, uh, recording came along and all that ended and, and the practice became who could make a definitive recording of the particular work. And so uh, this technology, so talk about the impact of different cultures on the same, te same technology. So the same technology that froze European music into a box uh, liberated uh, or, or really opened up the gates in African-American music. Okay, so African-American music goes on this, you know, steroid rush of innovation. <clears throat> and then, uh, and, and so uh, the solo playing becomes much more sophisticated. You know, in early jazz, solo playing, you know, the, not, I don't mean solo like nobody else is playing. I mean taking a solo. Uh, becomes every year it becomes more and more sophisticated as people sit and study the recordings of other people and and you get to Charlie Parker and then uh, and then the, that the, the notion of improvising starts to become a more real thing in that musical tradition. In fact, if you go back to Duke Ellington record and compare different recordings, the improvised parts are not improvised at all. They're empty places in the score for the trumpet player to decide what he wants to do. But if you compare various places where the group plays, you hear the trumpet player always does it the exact same every time. So, so the, it wasn't really improvisation like we think of it. It was just empty spots for the band to fill in. The, the, the parts that were open in the composition. Once they sort of filled it in, they had it the way they wanted to do it, they did it. Okay, by the time Charlie Parker's there, of course, every time he does this stuff, it's this very inventive thing. So then uh, Coltrane comes along and says, you know, well, I don't even need the chord changes. You know, just give me a key uh, because I don't even need it. And then Cecil Taylor in free jazz comes along and he says, well, I don't even need a key. You know, I don't need anything. I'll just play. And this is where that tradition intersects the European tradition, where for completely different reasons, you have people who want to just play, free, improvise. And it's the 1960s and... Um, and that resonates with broader cultural trends because the 60s is all about freedom, right? And so it really becomes a lifestyle choice, even more than a musical activity. And we get this generation of, you know, free improvisers, who most of you know the names of. They're all the seminal, you know, people. So when I come on the scene in the 1970s, you know, 10 years later, I'm like, these are the guys that I'm like, wow. So that, that, this is where I hook up my caboose to this train. 
Okay, so, <clears throat> um, but a funny thing had happened, which was already by this time, those tape recorders, remember it was the recorders that had made this possible. Without the recorders, this particular, without recording this particular definition of improvisation, which is the one we still think we have, would not have ever emerged. So it's a very, it's specific to a very particular time and place. Okay. So, um, but a funny thing had already happened. The fact of the recording itself. Because very quickly, uh, somebody decided to take a tape recorder and put it on stage and press go and play a tape and say, okay, that was my performance. And uh, everyone kind of scratched their hands like, well, was that a performance? Or, I don't know. Was that a performance? I don't know if that was a performance. And suddenly it became problematic what a performance was. Which is, that had never been a problem. You can date, you know, to an exact moment, the moment when performance became a problem, right? Because prior to that, you couldn't have music without performance, right? If nobody performed, there wouldn't be music. So a music, a performance was what you did in order to make music happen. Well, now music can happen in all kinds of ways. They can have an automated machine making music. So what constitutes a performance? Um, now, let's fast forward to now. And, and when I say now, let's say last 20 years. Okay? But even more now. And even more 10 years from now. Okay. So, uh, that machine that somebody put up on stage and pressed go and said, that's my performance. That machine has become much more complicated. Okay? I've got one right here. Far more complicated. Now, uh, I can still press go and have all kinds of amazing things come out of this box. And I could say, that's my performance. But we've become suspicious of that. And, uh, and, uh, what we do is we improvise. And, um, there's no compo performance of composed electronic music. There isn't. Because if, if there was, there would be no reason to not just press go. Um, so, because you can sequence anything. And you don't need a fixed sequence. You can have generative algorithms that do it differently every time. You know, you can, I mean, pressing go has become a very evolved concept from hitting that button on the, uh, on, on the tape recorder. All kinds of things can ensue once you press go, but they don't require your intervention. They don't require your body. They don't require your presence. So I would say that we're getting to a point where the meaning of improvisation is that improvisation is uh, the human body's last claim to a place in the performance of music. And that's why it's so important. And that's why we don't want to let go of it. And it intersects with another thing, which is this barrage of music that we're surrounded by, that the research group wants to map, and that I am so overwhelmed by that I don't ever want to make a recording ever again, because there's just too much out there. So, uh, and we have so many options on this, you know. <clears throat> One of the nice things about those 1970s synthesizers was that there were only a certain number of things you could do with them. You know, it's endless what I can do with this little map. So how do I decide? Right? Well, uh, if I'm playing sample-based music, how could I possibly, you know, 
should this sample go before this one and this one after that one or maybe should it be reversed or uh, <clears throat> you know if you write you know Mozart decided you know this note went there <laughs> That note went there. It's pretty hard. It's overwhelming now. And so we decide not to decide. We improvise. Right? It's a decision not to decide. Because we lose our criteria. When we're sitting there alone, it's like, I don't know. Should this sound go there? This one there? I don't know. I'll figure it out on stage. That will be, you know, my performance. My performance will be figuring out what the fuck to do with all this stuff. Um, To go back to the DJ. Now, I, I, I like to be provocative, you know, so I, I don't mean to diss anybody who's a DJ. And I, think, I actually do think there's amazing DJs. I do, without a doubt. I've seen extraordinarily talented people who did very exciting things as DJs. So I'm not talking about like the very, very small uh, subculture of people doing actually virtuosic things with churches. I'm talking about DJs as a broad cultural phenomenon. You know, they are everywhere now, everywhere. In San Francisco, you go into de- shopping stores, you know, department stores, and they have live DJs. They're playing for the shoppers. And, and uh, <clears throat> now, why? Why don't they just get an iPod and make a mix? And hit go, right? Hit play. Take that tape recorder up on. You know, there isn't even an audience. There's just shoppers. So, so why? Well, the claim is that they're improvising, right? They're spontaneously in the moment deciding. Well, this record should go next. And uh, or you go to clubs, and you know why don't they just make a mix? You know, they wouldn't even have to go hit play. They could stay home and hit play over the internet. And uh, right, uh, but the, the the claim is, well, they're spontaneously reading the vibe in the room, and they're like deciding what should happen next. You know, based on what people are doing. And like, I, you know, a few months ago, I went to a bar in San Francisco. I went to a gay bar in San Francisco, and it was like Monday night. And, and there was a live DJ there. And there were like five lonely guys at the bar staring into their beer, you know. And, it's, and, I, and I wanted to ask him, so are you really like spontaneously reading the vibe? In the room? <laughs> because, you know, it's not a good vibe. <laughs> and there he was. But this was a meaningful activity to him, you know. He was into it and he had his headphones and... and uh, so, uh, so, it, so, so, I, I think we're getting more and more to to the, this idea that what improvisation is is our last claim to having a human involved. Um, the other claim is dancing, um, and 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 because I. I, I, I don't think, you know, if a machine made art and only machine listened to it, I mean, is that art? I mean, I don't know. But uh, um, it, it, dancing is the way that the body has snuck back in to electronic music. In fact, I, I, I do think you can sort of look at the history of electronic music as the history of music performance. In, in the West as a, a high art music performance. Well, I'll just say it. This is heuristic. A lot of this is heuristic. Okay? But heuristics are good. I mean, you have to like venture something so that then you, know, you have something to knock down, right? So, um, so yeah, you have an early period where an audience sits in chairs and watches somebody on a stage doing amazing things with their body, making music. It's very powerful. And then you have this sort of intermediate, awkward stage where people sit on chairs in the audience and watch people sit on chairs on the stage and everyone's a little uncertain what's really going on. And now we have people sitting on stage on chairs watching people doing amazing things with their bodies in in the dance floor. 
And, and so the body sneaks back in, you know, because we do live in these things. I mean, we can't just leave them behind. I, we, actually, I don't think sensors on our brain are going to get us very far. You know, I, uh, um, the fact is that um, we, we don't live in our brains, actually. You know, we don't. I mean, that we like to think that now. That's a very current, you know, because we have all this brain research now. You know, we can actually monitor the, we have the technology now to view at brain activity without actually slicing somebody's head open and sticking stuff in. So we're, we're fascinated by the brain. But in fact, you know, our intelligence goes from head to toe. You know, there, there, there's, there's even, you know, synapses that don't even root through your brain, you know, that happen locally, all over. In fact, I, I think um, virtual, musical virtuosos actually, a lot of their stuff doesn't even root through their brain if you really wanted to go to that, that point. That's what a reflex is, you know, if you tap your knee and, yeah, that doesn't go through your brain. There's actually not enough time for it to go all the way up. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we're not our brains. And, uh, and somehow we have to live in these bodies. And um, so let me end. Uh, I'll just read a passage from the book, so, which is sort of a follow-up uh, from the first one. <laughs> okay. Countercultural milieu of the 1960s and early 1970s fundamentally shaped my early interest in synthesizers and electronic music. The prevailing view of technology and society at the time was captured in the Whole Earth Catalog, a sort of operating manual for the counterculture, which sold millions of copies and always seemed to be lying around wherever people with a countercultural bent congregated. Via the jumbled pages of the catalog, one could buy books by Buckminster Fuller. Remember, it was his lecture that triggered uh, Engelbart's epiphany. Uh, learn how to tell the age of a cow, identify edible plants, and order composting toilets and Moog synthesizers. Uh, the common thread through this eclectic collage was that every item was seen by the editors of the catalog as a tool for personal empowerment. The motivating idea was that access to tools, which was the catalog subtitle, would lead to a more peaceful and enlightened culture through the diffusion of knowledge and know-how. Uh, the catalog described its mission like this. So far, remotely done power and glory. We don't need to read that. Okay. It was no coincidence that the catalog was published out of the area south of San Francisco that would later become known as Silicon Valley, for the social circle from which the catalog emerged also produced the personal computer. Parts of the very earliest personal computers were available through the catalog, and publishers hoped that the widespread adoption of personal computers would lead to the radical democratization of society they imagined. Today, these ideas seem hopelessly anachronistic and naive. Our current access to tools is without precedent. Our lives are inundated with digital tools that promise to improve communication, but seem only to make us more alienated. Electronic music has exploded out of the avant-garde to become the deafening monochrome background roar of wired yet disconnected culture. Discarded consumer electronics are piling up in landfills in Africa, leaching their heavy metals into the already impoverished soil. Every technological advance seems to bring a further erosion of privacy, a new kind of violence, and another environmental disaster. It's harder and harder to see anything empowering in all of this. Uh, in the 1970s, when I was a student, my teacher, Derek John Mizell, suggested that instead of using technology to make new sounds, I should try to use technology to create new relationships between musicians. Our ears, he argued, are fast learners. The first time we hear a sound we've never heard before, we perceive the sound as new. And in the 1970s, the sound of electronically synthesized music was indeed new in this sense for many people. 
But this newness is very short-lived, and sounds we have only recently been introduced to quickly become as familiar as those we have heard our entire lives. Derry John felt that by using technology to create new human relationships instead of new sounds, a more fruitful artistic practice could be forged. He was an inspiring teacher, and I attempted to follow his advice. But as I proceeded in this direction, when I stood back and looked at the body of work I was building, what stood out was not the technologically mediated relationships between musicians, but the confrontational relation of musicians and machines. In fact, one could easily place my work in a narrative of increasingly explicit awareness of this shift. Uh, one example of that is uh, I had a project for years uh, I called Say No More. It was a quartet, uh, bass, drums, vocals, and myself uh, with sampling. And uh, all the musicians were, were virtuoso improvisers. And uh, the way the group worked is uh, I asked them each to rec- improvise something separately without just, you know, so they each went into a studio separately, improvised something, sent me the tape. I took the three takes, put them into the computer, broke them up into little fragments, and assembled a, a band, and released that as the groups for a CD. And then I gave that recording to them and said, okay, you know, this, learn to play it. This is your score. Um, <clears throat> so they had to sort of sit down and relearn their own playing. Um, and then we got together and rehearsed it as a band, toured with it, recorded a live concert, released that as the second CD, so that was the live group playing the composition made on the computer out of the fragments of the solos. Then I took that recording, put it back into the computer, ripped it up into bits, made a new composition, released that as the third CD, and then gave that to them and said, okay, learn to play that, and then they learned that, and then we toured it, and then we did So it was a, a cycle that was alternatively human and virtual, human and virtual. And um, when I conceived of it, this was exactly one of those projects where I thought that I'll be using technology to create a new relationship between musicians. Okay? In fact, there will be a bunch of interesting new relationships here. There will be a new relationship between a composer and a performer because I'll be composing you know, with their material and then they're going to hear themselves refracted through my lens. So that's a new relationship. There will be a a new relationship between improvisation and composition because it will all be composed, but it will all be improvised. In fact, that this line will become vague. But as soon as we started performing, it became obvious that where the action was in that piece was the confrontation of human bodies and machines. Because I had composed, I hadn't left room for anybody to breathe or be human. And, 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 the, and, the, and the performances became, you know, these, these humans trying to keep up with this superhuman image of themselves that they couldn't possibly do. And they would fail in all kinds of interesting ways. And that, it, you know, I, I loved the project. It was... It, I thought it was a very successful project in the sense that we did develop a, a body of music that there was no other way we could have developed it except through that process. No way I would have ever written that music or we wouldn't have arrived at that music. But what was so interesting about it was this tension between the human embodiment and the virtual and the human and the virtual. Um, so... Um, This reassessment of the meaning of technology in my own work paralleled a similar long-term shift in my understanding of the role of technology in the broader culture. The idea that new musical relationships between musicians can be created through technology is analogous to the idea that new social and political relationships between people can be forged with technology. This is the central claim of the information technology industry, But the more familiar I become with information technology, the more deeply I doubt that it creates any new relationships at all. Once all the hoopla dies down, it seems that what we are left with is the same old relationships and new packaging. What changes is not so much our relationships with each other, but our relationship with technology, and by extension, our relationship with the natural world. Joel Chatterby wrote a book called Electronic Sound, The Past and Promise of Electronic Music, 
which has become the standard introductory text to the subject of electronic music at universities around the United States. Chatterby starts off his book by setting up the American, com- the American composer John Philip Sousa as his straw man. Chatterby has Sousa complaining about the intrusion of machines into the world of music and quotes Sousa asking, quote, when a mother can turn a phonograph Turn on a phonograph with the same ease that she applies to the electric light. Will she croon her baby to sleep with sweet lullabies, or will the infant be put to sleep by machinery? To Chatterby, Seuss's concerns are so ridiculous on their face that they hardly need refuting. Echoing the words of Edgar Varese from a half century before, Chatterby argues that, quote, the electronic musical instrument in its myriad forms may turn out to be the most beneficial to humans and the most enjoyable, rewarding, and expressive instrument that has ever existed. I would like to plant myself firmly on the side of John Philip Sousa in this debate. The idea that electronic music technology is more, quote, beneficial to humans, close quote, than all other music is absurd. Whereas Seuss's question about whether children will be put to sleep by machines does point to the heart of the issue of how human beings and their increasingly complex technology are going to coexist. This, in the end, is the issue with which all of my work is engaged, and I believe it is the fundamental issue of our time. We see it everywhere, from the smallest scale where we struggle not to be overwhelmed by our cell phones, iPods, and laptops, to the larger scale where we struggle to contain the unprecedented power of transnational corporations whose vast holdings and operations are made possible only by equally vast arrays of networked computers, and where we confront the enormously destructive power of weapons that are more and more readily available to smaller and smaller groups of people, to the truly global scale of world climate change. If art that makes intensive use of the latest technology is to be relevant in such a time, it must begin from here how the tense and difficult confrontation of humans and their machines is reshaping our world. So there's probably somebody had some thought. A few years ago, I went to the Sydney Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras, which is this huge, you know, parade and gay festival they have in Australia. And uh, they have, uh, it was a very funny experience for me because they have concerts, you know, and uh, and uh, they invited me to do a concert. And then they had a celebrity viewing booth for the parade who they invited guests, artists, but they didn't make any distinction between the artists, so it was like me and Cher and Jean-Paul Gaultier and Zena the Warrior Princess. <laughs> and I, I, I took a picture of Zena and I, and I took it home to my daughter, who was in elementary school at the time. She looked at it, and she looked at me, and she said, had they heard your music by <laughs> But anyway, what, what the reason I, because I, so I stood there and watched this parade go by, and it's, it takes hours. There's a million people in the street. It's the biggest event in Australia, and um, <clears throat> every group, you, you can't. It's not like uh, the Gay Day Parade in San Francisco, which like the gay electrical utility workers, you know, walked on the street in matching T-shirts. Like in this parade, you actually have to have choreography and. A flow, and they have this huge warehouse, and, and they help you get your act together if you want to participate. So, so it's a, a million people dancing in the street for about seven hours, and then the parade ends up at this huge fairgrounds, and they have a 12-hour party at the fairgrounds from um, 11 p.m. to 11 a.m. Another 12 hours. So altogether, the event lasts 19 hours. And in the uh, fairground, there's five pavilions, huge pavilions, each one with different nonstop music. And uh, so I saw the whole thing. And uh, uh, you know how many musicians were involved? One. (laughs) One. At one of the pavilions, 
uh, at a certain at the high time of night, uh, a pop star comes out and sings one song to canned music. Now, uh, not one of the groups in the parade had anybody playing an instrument. Not one. There was no marching band. Or nothing. Now, imagine before recorded music, how many musicians it would have taken to keep a million people dancing for 19 hours. <laughs> and they've got it down to one. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that's the answer to the question. So, so the rest was um, just play that, or was there a DJ? If there was a DJ, you couldn't see him. I mean, these were these huge cavernous spaces. Maybe there was a DJ someplace. I don't know. I don't know. On the floats, it was all obviously recorded music. Um, so, and, okay, let's say there was a DJ in each of the five plays, so it's six. <laughs> Doesn't really, you know, for a million people, we're not talking about a very significant difference. Um, you know, but I don't mean to, uh, um, I don't mean to make that sound as dire as I think it just sounded when I said that, because I don't think, you know, human creativity goes away. It's not like people are just going to stop being creative. But I think the scale of cultural upheaval we're looking at here is so huge. I mean, you know, the, the way we think about our creativity is, uh, is changing in, in, in a way that's bigger than most of us can get our brains around, certainly bigger than, than, than I can. Like, the meaning, the, this category of artist, I don't know. I don't know if that category is going to survive. I don't know if, uh, you know, video artist, how can there be a video artist in the age of YouTube? I mean, YouTube is that skateboard that anybody can get on, right? I mean, everybody's a video artist. It, you know, everybody's a photographer. Susan Sontag can't tell the difference between an amateur and the most skilled photographer. So, there's a, you know, my big hero these days it is Glenn Gould. Glenn Gould.